criteria for good and bad action. As mentioned earlier, the law of karma, karma niyama, is most closely linked to psychological laws, citta niyama, and conventional laws, samadhi niyama. This close relationship between the three can cause confusion for people. Therefore, in order to clearly understand the subject of karma, of good and evil, it is important to distinguish the boundaries between these three laws. The law of karma overlaps psychological laws, yet there is also a clear point of separation. Intention, Chaitana, which is the essence and primary agent within the law of karma, makes this law independent from other laws, or it provides people with a rule independent of other laws. Intention enables a person, personal sphere of deliberation and design to the extent that people claim to be equal to or to compete with nature and distinguish their own world of creations from the domain of nature. Intention relies on mechanisms of psychological laws in order to function. When a person performs intentional actions, the fruition of these actions rely on psychological laws in order to carry on. This is similar to someone driving a motorboat. The driver is like intention, which pertains to the law of karma. The boat's engine is like the mechanisms and various factors of the mind, which pertain to psychological laws. The driver must rely on the engine, the direction which the boat, i.e. a person's life, along with his or her body goes, is determined by the driver. The driver relies on and derives benefit from the engine, yet he is ultimately responsible for where the boat goes. This is similar to how the law of karma relies on and derives benefit from psychological laws. Intentional action, however, is responsible for the direction life goes including the consequences one's decisions have for the mind and body. The relationship between the law of karma and psychological laws generally causes no problems, because people tend not to give it much attention, regardless of the level of interest people have in it or even whether people are af aware of it or not, this relationship functions automatically, generally out of sight from people. On the contrary, the relationship between the law of karma and conventional laws causes much confusion for people. Many people have doubts about good and evil. They question what is good and evil, what is the true validity behind marking an action as good or evil, and what are the criteria for determining good and evil. Many people claim that good and evil are concepts exclusively determined and assigned by the people, by people and by society. The same action may be labelled good in one society or by one generation, but labelled bad in a, another society or at another point in history. The same action may be endorsed by one society and forbidden by another. For example, some tribal cultures may decree that killing members of another tribe is good, while more developed cultures will recognise that the killing of all human beings is wrong. Some religions teach that killing animals for food is blameless, while other religions teach that injuring any living creature is unskillful. Some cultures say that it is good for a woman to have several husbands, while others say that a woman should have only one. They may even prescribe that a woman should jump into her husband's funeral pyre. 
Some societies declare that children should honour and obey their elders without dispute, while others declare that mutual respect and honour is independent of age, and that everyone should engage in a reasoned debate. They claim that concepts of good and evil are conventional designations created by people and by society is largely true. Having said this, such conventional designations have no bearing on the law of karma, and one should be careful not to, to confuse the two. Conventional designations of good and evil pertain to conventional laws. Samati ni yama. <coughs> they are distinct from matters of good and evil. Matters of wholesomeness and unwholesomeness pertaining to the law of karma, kama niyama. Although these two laws are related, they have a clear point of separation. Confusion arises because people are often unable to distinguish between the two. The fact that it acts as a bridge between these two laws and also acts to separate them is the same as the distinction distinguishing factor between the law of karma and psychological laws, i.e. intention, chitana. This will be examined in more detail below. In relation to the law of karma, there are several important aspects to social proscriptions. Social prescriptions are not directly connected to the wholesome and unwholesome, as dictated by the law of karma. They are established by society for a particular objective, say for social harmony and peace. They manifest as a form of mutual agreement or commitment. These prescriptions may lead to social peace and well-being, or they may not. They may be beneficial or even harmful. This depends on how comprehensive the knowledge is of those who enact these prescriptions or on these people's level of sincerity. These prescriptions come in many forms, from various customs and traditions up to a body of laws. Here, good and evil is determined by these conventional laws, samati ni yama. The concepts of good and evil in this case are varied and variable. Their variation and changeability, however, do not pertain to the law of karma, karma ni yama. The two sets of laws should not be confused. When someone transgresses these prescriptions, this is a matter of pertaining to conventional laws, not to the law of karma. Now we can examine how these social conventions enter into the domain of the law of karma. When someone accepts these prescriptions, regardless of whether these prescriptions are virtuous and beneficial or not, yet he or she decides to disobey them. At that moment, there is an intention to disobey or to transgress them. Moreover, the person will be aware of these intentions without being able to ignore or deny them. Intention here is connected directly to the law of karma. Some societies may try to include the factor of intention when passing judgment on people in order to determine whether the infringement of a law was performed intentionally or not. But this is still a matter pertaining to social conventions. It simply indicates that this society is intelligent and knows how to benefit from the law of karma. In regard to the law of karma, regardless of whether a society examines whether a person acted intentionally or not, or whether it determines if a law has been transgressed or not, 
the karmic process has begun the moment a person has an intention to infringe on a socially accepted prescription and act upon this intention. The process of bearing karmic fruit, vipaka, has been set in motion and the person begins to experience the results of his or her volitional actions. The goodness or badness of an action in such a case must be considered from the perspective of conventional laws. It is not directly related to the law of karma. It is linked to the law of karma when one takes into account the intention and level of wisdom of those people who have enacted these prescriptions. In regard to observing and upholding these prescriptions, the law of karma is only related in the area of acknowledging and accepting these socially prescribed terms and then acting intentionally in some way or another in response to them. Technically speaking, the dynamics discussed so far are part of virtuous conduct, sila. They reveal the connection between human laws and the laws of nature, which must be clearly distinguished. There are situations where conventional designations of good and bad are indirectly related to the law of karma. For example, a society may prescribe a particular action as good and correct to be observed by everyone. Later, someone endowed with wisdom recognizes that, in fact, this action is neither good nor beneficial and may even be harmful to society. That person may try to explain this to other members of society, try to revise their ways of conduct, and perhaps even refuse to observe this custom. In such a circumstance, the the person's actions do not spring from defilement, defiled intention, as is the case for someone who breaks a law for unwholesome reasons. Instead, it springs from intention accompanied by wisdom, aiming to improve the well-being of others. The gist of the karmic process is not the same, as it depends on the quality of intention. In any case, whatever the quality of intention, the perpetrator of such an act is aware of the specific intention and must receive the fruit of it according to the law of karma. He may be able to hide from or deceive society, but he cannot hide from his own mind, nor can he deceive the laws of nature. In a nutshell, the determining factor in regard to the law of karma is whether intention is wholesome or unwholesome. Generally speaking, there is no transgression or no intent to transgress when society agrees un anonymously to repeal or amend a law or prescription. In such a case, the transgressor has not comprised his integrity or betrayed a social contract. This can be illustrated by some simple examples. Imagine two people live together. In order for both people to live at ease, they lay down certain regulations. They say say they work at different locations and return home at different times but they agree to eat, but they agree to eat supper together they cannot wait for the other person forever so they each agree not to eat supper alone before seven in the morning one of them likes cats and dislikes dogs. The other likes dogs and dislikes cats. They therefore agree not to have any pets in the house. If either of them decides not to honour one of these agreements, the intention to breach it arises and things proceed according to the laws of karma. This is so 
even though in truth eating before 7 in the morning or bringing a pet into the house is neither inherently good nor bad. Another two people may lay down an opposite set of regulations if one of the two persons recognizes that regulations in fact are unconducive to their communal well-being they must discuss whether to revoke or to change them neglecting to follow these regulations then does not entail an intention to transgress them the Vinaya, the monastic set of training rules, is linked to intention as part of a person's conduct, culminating in his or her moral integrity, sila. Here one can see both the relationship and the distinction between uncertain, indefinite matters of good and evil, of right and wrong, prescribed by a society, and certain definite matters of wholesomeness and unwholesomeness pertaining to the law of karma. There exists a relationship between social prescriptions and the law of karma. Having said this, regardless of whether a society defines good and evil with an understanding of what is truly wholesome and unwholesome, of what is favourable and what is harmful to people, or whether it lacks this understanding, the dynamics of the law of karma proceed naturally, unaltered by the social prescriptions. A society may endorse the taking of intoxicants, believing that they may that they make people happy. It may advocate violent emotions. It may believe that one should incite and stimulate people increasing their desires and competitiveness in order for them to be more productive. It may claim that killing other groups of people is good or that killing animals is blameless. In such cases, the so-called goodness of social prescriptions conflicts with wholesomeness within the law of karma. From a social perspective, these prescriptions or beliefs may have both positive and negative consequences. The endorsement of intoxicants, for example, may greatly increase the state's income by way of excise tax. But at the same time, many members of society may end up dull and idle or debilitated and crime may be rampant. The belief that people should be frenetically productive may lead to rapid advancements in the material well-being of society, but it may also lead to an increase in heart disease, mental illness, suicide, and an abnormal number of other problems. Similarly, in a society that condones the killing of other human beings, its members will be viewed by outsiders as cruel and untrustworthy. Many of these consequences manifesting in society may also spring from dynamics within the law of karma. At beginning stages, however, to avoid confusion, one should distinguish between results occurring from social prescriptions and results occurring from the law of karma. Later one can examine how these two dynamics are linked. In regard to the law of karma, there are two levels of intention. First, there is intention accompanied by an adherence to a social prescription, which manifests, for example, as benefits or values. Second, there is the intention to either observe or to disobey a prescription at a particular moment in time. In any case, the reaping of karmic fruit begins immediately once one has established an intention. Take, for example, a person who revels in drinking alcohol. While drinking, his intention will be accompanied by a dim-witted form of delight. If he drinks regularly, he will develop this state of mind as an 
habitual disposition. <coughs> when someone who is frantically vying to obtain things is engaged in work, his intention will be accompanied by stress and desperation, which will become habitual features of his mind. Although someone who is determined to kill others may be praised and rewarded by his society, at the time of killing his intention is accompanied by malice and cruelty, or by wild ambition. If he frequently indulges in such killing, these states of mind may develop to form his entire personality. The quality of his mind will become coarser and will lose its refinement subtlety and tenderness. Here the term Chaitana intention should be inspected more closely. In the Pali Canon, the meaning of the term Chaitana is more subtle and refined than the meaning of intention in English. Generally speaking, the term intention in English is used when one wishes to link internal deliberations with external actions. For example, people may say he had a slip of the tongue, he didn't intend to say that, or she acted intentionally. In Dhamma teachings, i.e. according to the principle of karma, however, deliberate speech, physical actions and thoughts, memories and recollections, and emotional responses to things received by way of the five senses, no matter how minor or temporary, are all accompanied by intention. Chaitana re- thus refers to volition, purpose and deliberation, to selecting the objects for attention. Intention is the principal factor for steering and activating the mind which then inclines towards or turns away from things, or pursues a a specific direction. It is the leader, director and governor of the mind, determining how one relates to various things. It shapes the course of the mind, and in the end it conditions one particular state of mind. When intention arises, karma manifests. When karma manifests, it produces immediate effects. Because with the arising of intention, the mind becomes active, there is mental activity. Even in the case of minor fleeting thoughts, which do not bear any significant fruit, they still have an effect. At the very least, they constitute a form of fine karmic dust that accumulates in the mind and affects its properties. When it increases, for instance, when the mind resorts to these thoughts frequently, or when they intensify and are expressed as an outward actions, their effects become stronger, developing into a person's habits and personality. Take the example of harmful deeds. One need not examine an action as dire as killing another person, even damaging something of very little value if performed with malicious intent or or a mind of anger. Say tearing up a piece of useless paper out of irritation has an effect on the quality of the mind. It is not the same as someone tearing up an unneeded paper with an ordinary state of mind. When one performs a volitional action repeatedly, the effects of this karmic accumulation become more obvious and may gradually magnify in scope. This is similar to dust settling in a room, in a way unnoticed by the person living there. All volitional actions bears some kind of fruit. Apart from the amount and the potency of the comic effects accumulated, the level of their importance is also related to the specific quality and function of the mind. There needs to be plenty of dust on a road before it is considered to be filthy. A lesser amount of dust on the floor 
of a living room is considered to be dirty. An amount less than that on the surface of a desk is considered unclean and may disturb the person working there. A small amount of dust on a mirror soils it and diminishes its usefulness. And a minuscule amount of dust on a pair of glasses is noticeable and blurs one's vision. A similar analogy is that of using a knife to scrape a road surface, a floor in a house, or a pair of glasses, respectively. Reverse similes also apply. Compare using a small velvet cloth or a wad of cloth wool to wipe a floor, in contrast to using it to clean a pair of glasses. No intentional action is fruitless, which is summed up by these Buddhist sayings. All accumulated deeds, both good and bad, bear fruit. Actions marked as kama, even trifling ones, are not devoid of result. Neither good nor bad deeds are performed in vain. People tend to overlook the importance of the subtle effects of volitional action at the level of the mind. Here are two more similes to help clarify this matter. There are many different degrees of clean and dirty water, example marsh water, river water, tap water and distilled water. Marsh water may be used as a habitat for various creatures, but it is not suitable for bathing, drinking or other more refined purposes. River water is suitable for bathing and for washing clothes, but perhaps not suitable for drinking. Tap water may be used for drinking, but not for intravenous injections. For ordinary purposes, tap water is adequate for people's overall needs, but if one is faced with special circumstances, it is insufficient. This is similar to differences in the quality of mind. In terms of varying degrees of coarseness and subtlety, turbidity and brightness, due to one's actions performed and accumulated. During much of one's life, one may not feel there is a problem with mediocre or relatively coarse states of mind. But later on, one may be faced with a situation calling for more refined states of mind. One's accumulated actions in the past may cause problems, and one's habitual state of mind may be inadequate for the circumstances. Indeed, it may even be completely dysfunctional. Water may exist in various degrees of undulation or stillness. Example, surging ocean swells, small waves on a river due to the passing of a motorboat, a trickling stream, a tranquil pond, and a totally still water in a vessel. In some cases, one may be able to make use of undulating water, but in other cases, one may need the water to be so still that one is able to float a needle on the surface. This is similar to the quality of the mind, either coarse or refined, which is relevant to one's specific mental application and to arriving at exceptional states attainable by human beings. Conventional law of samadhi and niyama and the law of kama, kama niyama, are distinct from one another. The kamic process follows on its own nature, independent of any social prescriptions which may run counter to it. But because there is a relationship between these two sets of laws, a person who acts appropriately is a wish the law of karma, i.e. adheres to wholesome principles, may face problems from conflicting social prescriptions. 
For example, those people who live in a society that endorses the taking of intoxicants but wish not to partake of these themselves receive some effects from their actions. Although their clear and bright states of mind are not sullied by intoxicants, they may be ridiculed by others for being weak or looked down on in other ways. Even within the domain of karma, they may experience difficulties from resisting these social customs and norms, leading to some degree of conflict in the mind, depending on their level of wisdom, which dispels any sense of disease. In a developed and wise society, people draw upon the experiences from past generations to determine what is truly beneficial to human beings and what is not. They then establish conventional laws and regulations dealing with good and evil that are in harmony with principles of wholesomeness and unwholesomeness conforming to the law of karma. This ability to synchronize social prescriptions with karmic principles is one way of measuring how developed or civilized a particular society is. In this sense, when one evaluates the merits of social prescriptions having to do with good and evil, one may look at them from two angles. First, from the perspective of conventional laws, do these prescriptions lead to the welfare of society? And second, from the perspective of the law of karma, are they wholesome and conducive to people's overall well-being? Some social prescriptions may have been followed and upheld for centuries, but are not in fact beneficial. Neither, neither from the perspective of conventional laws nor from the perspective of, perspective of the law of karma. Members of such a society should agree to abolish these prescriptions. Alternatively, they may need to rely on a wise, pure-hearted and compassionate person for encouragement, as was the case when the Buddha persuaded people to abandon animal sacrifices and do away with the caste system in India. When one notices that particular prescriptions are advantageous on a social level, example, they are conducive to material prosperity, yet that they are incompatible with the principles of wholesomeness according to the law of karma, one should remember the following fact. Sometimes people mistake what is essentially unfavorable for society as something beneficial. That is, they are pleased by a false form of progress, which is satisfying in the short term but harmful in the long term. Those things that are truly beneficial should be compatible with the wholesome principles outlined in the law of karma. Those things that are spiritually beneficial to an individual are generally beneficial to all people. Here one can make a comparison to material progress. Most people wish for material prosperity, believing that an abundance of material things and a surplus of comfort will lead to the highest good for society. They therefore strive to maximize the degree of material development. Meanwhile, they often destroy those modes of existence that are seen as outdated and obstacles to progress. Eventually, however, they may realize that many of their actions have been faulty. Although their society may appear to be advanced, many hazards to physical health and to people's very existence have been created to the extent that if people persist in these new ways of acting, they may be heading for calamity or annihilation. Just as one should promote material progress that is not harmful to people's physical well-being, so too one should nurture the kind of social development that is not harmful to people's spiritual life. 
As part of practical analysis of good and evil, the Buddha first encouraged people to reflect on the wholesome and the unwholesome as the essential factor for evaluation. He developed the teaching to include an awareness of good and evil as it manifests in the mind, but he to apply it to one's conscience. And a consideration of the opinions by wise individuals as a frame of reference. These two factors act as the basis for moral shame, hiri, and fear of wrongdoing, or tapa. Moreover, he encouraged people to consider the fruits of their actions as they affect themselves and others, that is, on an individual and social level. Because some people lack a necessary depth of wisdom, and may not recognize for themselves what is wholesome and unwholesome, the Buddha encouraged them to consider the opinions of the wise. If they still have doubt, then they should examine the effects of their own actions, even as they relate to social conventions. This threefold examination, an awareness of the wholesome and unwholesome, a consideration of the opinions by the wise and an examination of the effect of one's actions leads to a comprehensive analysis. To sum up, when evaluating what is good and bad karma, one first takes intention, jetana, into consideration to decide if an action constitutes karma. And then one may apply the following criteria. Principal criteria when measuring the wholesome and the unwholesome to consider whether intention springs from a wholesome root, kusala mula, i.e. non-greed, non-hatred and non-delusion, or whether it springs from an unwholesome root, a kusala mula, i.e. greed, hatred and delusion. To consider whether an action is truly conducive to spiritual well-being or not, is it conducive to mental ease, health, peace and clarity? Does it strengthen or impair the mind? Does it help to increase wholesome qualities and decrease unwholesome qualities or vice versa? Moreover, what sort of effect does it have on one's personality? B. Associated criteria. 2. Applying one's conscience, one's inner sense of right and wrong. One asks whether, by acting in such a way, is one worthy of self-criticism, and does one lose one's self-respect? 3. Considering the declarations by wise and knowledgeable individuals, one asks whether a particular action would be approved by the wise. Would they praise it or condemn it? For considering the attributes and fruits of action, both in relation to oneself and others. A. Does action harm or cause distress for oneself or others? B. Does an action lead to the welfare or to the suffering of oneself or others? Note that the two sub-factors of criteria 1 and above this are essentially the same. They both focus on whether an action is beneficial or harmful to people's spiritual life. Generally speaking, the approval and disapproval and the praise and criticism of wise individuals is institutionalized or systemized as religious, cultural and legal teachings and prescriptions. Though some laws and customs do not accord with the opinions of the wise, and some actions conflicting with established laws and customs may not be censored by the wise, one may say that these cases are exceptional. It the responsibility of wise individuals in society to regularly investigate these matters. In reference to this process, the Buddha used the terms investigated by the wise. Anu Vicha Vinu. The wise first investigate a specific matter and then express their approval or disapproval. 
Having investigated these matters, they amend those things wrongly praised, wrongly practiced or prescribed, or those things that have deviated from their original and correct purpose. The Buddha, for example, rejected the caste system and the tradition of animal sacrifices. There is another set of criteria for determining good and evil, or good and bad karma, which takes into account the law of karma on its own, as well as the law of karma in relation to conventional laws. It examines actions from the perspective of natural laws, the real inherent value of actions, as well as from the perspective of values attributed to actions by human beings. It contains the same principles as the outline described above, but arranges them in a different way. 1. A reference to advantages and disadvantages on the level of the mind. One considers whether an action is supportive or unsupportive to a person's spiritual life, whether it enhances a person's quality of life, whether it strengthens or impairs the mind, whether it leads to the increase or decrease of wholesome and unwholesome qualities, whether it leads to a positive development of a person's personality. To a reference to advantages and disadvantages on the level of the individual, one considers whether an action causes distress or harm to oneself, and whether it damages or promotes true inner well-being. 3. A reference to advantages and disadvantages on the level of society, one considers whether an action causes distress or harm to others, whether it damages or promotes the true well-being of others or of society. For a reference to one's natural sense of conscience, one considers actions by applying one's own sense of right and wrong, by, ask, by asking after a deed is completed, whether one is open to self-criticism and self-blame. 5. A reference to social standards, one considers actions according to religious, cultural and other social prescriptions, example laws and edicts. These prescriptions rely on the examination and scrutiny by wise individuals in a particular society who help to ensure that people do not uphold them naively or inadvisedly. These wise individuals also determine whether to accept or reject these prescriptions.